Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with famed knife designer, Leong Ma. Leong started his illustrious career in knives as a full-time chef in New York City and is today known as one of the most prolific and sought-after knife designers on the market. I first heard the name Leong Ma when his design for CRKT, the aggressive and gorgeous eraser, dropped 12 or so years ago. Unlike most knives from that brand, the eraser received a lot of industry buzz as well as glowing accolades from knife snobs. Uh, years later, Leong, Leong has two companies bringing his superlative designs to the pockets of knife junkies everywhere. We'll meet him, we'll meet Leong and find out how he got here. But first, be sure to like and comment and subscribe and hit the notification bell and share the show with a friend. That's a great thing to do to help the show. And if you want to help sh uh, support the show financially, you can go to Patreon. The quickest way to do that is to head on over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Leong, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thank you for having me, Bob. Oh, man, it is a great pleasure and honor to have you. I've been um, uh, reaching out to you in vain for a long time. That's, that's how it works. People are uh, hard to get in touch with until you finally do. And man, I am so glad that we have this opportunity to talk. You know, it is, it's funny you say that because I don't even, I don't know how you reached out to me because I don't, I don't remember seeing it, but that is my fault. Okay. That's not your fault uh, at all. And it was funny because I, I do a, a similar uh, conversation with my friend Lee, love them knives. And he brought up your name. And so I was like, so I went, every time we talk, you know, we, we, I kind of like, I'm, I'm on the phone. I do a search of like whose name he's dropping. And I was like, holy cow. I think that time you had like a video with, uh, Bob Terzola, you know, mm -hmm. the godfather of tactical knives. Right. And so I was like, okay, let me see if reaching out to him and, you know, stuff, see, see what he says. And then you, you immediately send me a message back. I was like, Oh my God, no way. You want me on this? I will be on this. You tell me a time. Well, you know, you know why you didn't know? Uh, I was reaching out to you through Instagram DMs and that's, that's kind of an oh. amateur move, but that's, uh, you know, I was sliding into your DMs. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've always been a great admirer of your, of your work and, and yeah, it's, it, uh, it had to happen. I tell, I tell a lot of people, if you want me to like, look at your message, just email me. Because the DMs, they keep getting pushed down. So if you don't get to it in a particular time, you never see it. And you can't, like, you don't see the same DM twice sometimes, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. Well, uh, in my intro, uh, something that uh, fascinates me, uh, and I've kind of known this about you for quite some time, is your culinary past and mm -hmm. perhaps present. I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I lived in New York City uh, for about 12 years, and that's where I met my wife and and uh, mm -hmm. we loved, you know, back in the childless days, we loved going out and spending our money at, at nice restaurants and, oh, yeah. and exploring uh, culinarily. That, what, where did you work? And tell me what it was like so working I, in the New York City restaurant industry. I come from um, a restaurant background. My family owned a restaurant in Malaysia. And, um, you know, growing up, I was just running through the kitchens in my grandmother's restaurant that my dad managed and my mom worked in while she was growing up. So I grew up very comfortably just being in the kitchen, being, you know, around the restaurant setting. And during, during growing up in high school, I worked at Dunkin' Donuts when I was 14 years old and I was baking donuts. I was making the donuts and everything, making the muffins. And so while I was in high school and back then we had like a guidance counselor and they were like, well, what do you want to do after you leave high school? I'm like, I don't really know, but um, I'm very comfortable in the kitchen and I'm fat in the kitchen. And so they told me like, well, have you taken home ec? I'm like, what's home ec? They're like, that's where you learn how to cook. 
And I'm like, I already know how to cook, <laughs> but I'll take this course, whatever. So they put me in the course and I went to Franklin Kaling High School in the border of Brooklyn and Queens. And I my teacher was Mrs. Gonzalez, nicest teacher I've ever met, who like she recognized what what I what I had and she was like, Yeah, you're very fast. Dude. Do you want to go to some like after school competition? And I was like, oh, cool. okay, why not? So I would, she would put together like a tote bag of like 30 pounds of kitchen equipment and I'll take the subway into Manhattan or other parts of the city and do these small competitions with other high schoolers in New York City. And then it kind of went all the way up to like where we had a major competition. And I had like a full scholarship to New York City Technical College in Brooklyn because of it. And so I never thought I would ever get anything like that, but I was just training and having fun. And I got like a full scholarship, you know, for that. Oh. So, and, and the school, you know, I, I had to learn like math and science and all this other stuff. And, you know, went to like wine class and all this, but I, I graduated with a four year degree. And then I went to work in like a lot of restaurants. I went to work in all kinds of restaurants, like French restaurants. And French food was really the thing that I specialized in because I, I saw like the like it, the time and the love and the really like when um, when someone actually tries that food, they really they really see the amount of time and expertise that you know, the, the person in the kitchen, you know, you know, put together. And that's, that's why, um, you know, that's the one area that I really wanted to transcend. And it was like the, the love affair with like food being art. And so I worked in all kinds of restaurants. I worked from like um, mostly French restaurants like La Carabelle, Boulet Bakery, uh, uh, windows on the world i trained in i trained at uh my last job was at the ritz carlton in barry park city um also um you know so it's like um yeah <laughs> all these places and it's just like yeah i mean i spent about 15 years in the kitchen and I, i'm like man i couldn't go back right now i have not been in the kitchen for uh, over 10 years since uh the last recession around 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, if I was to go back now, they would kick my butt because we uh, we would run circles for about 20 hours a day, you know. So it's a it's a very high intense job and you have to you have to be able to do it, you know. And so even though I love it, I, I now know that, oh, my God, I'd rather spend time drawing, looking at new materials, testing out uh, edges and all this other stuff that and cook for myself at home and cook for friends and family at home, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I still do that. And I talked to a lot of friends, like, uh, I was, I had a conversation with a, a colleague and, and we, 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 we write up things about what we want to do and we kind of keep each other accountable. And so she's the opposite of me. She hates going shopping in the supermarket where I love going to the supermarket. Yeah. Right. And like, I'm, and she's like, oh, I just do it because I need to. I'm like, oh my God, I look for ingredients that I can't find. And if it saves me time, I got every kind of kitchen gadget that you could imagine, <laughs> you know? And it's like, why? But it's just like, yeah, you know, because I live in, I live in Palm Bay and you don't have a lot of different culinary type of food here. So Bay, if I, that? it's in Florida. Florida. Okay. It's right in the middle of Florida on the East Coast side. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we move away uh, from cooking, I, uh, I have to say, first of all, I had my 27th birthday at Windows on the World. I remember that. I can remember oh back God. that far. And uh, yeah, that was cool. That was amazing. I, I wish I still had the photographs from there. Uh, if you don't know, that was the uh, restaurant on top of World Trade Center 2, I think, or yeah. 1. I'm not sure which yeah. building it was, but. Uh, but also, uh, I'm interested in the, uh, so you were talking about how French cooking really got you because of the artistry that goes into it and the, uh, slow preparation and, uh, the care 
mm-hmm. that when you're tasting that food, you can taste that care and that slow preparation. Uh, right. how, how, how does that, um, how does that now translate into your, let's get into knife design into, uh, that so, for you. Like, uh, I have thousands of designs on my, on my hard drives that will probably never see the, the light of day. And because I just sit there and refine and refine until I have something that I feel is perfect. And really once um, you debut a design, you don't want to come up with so many. You, can, you want to allow uh, customers and even people who have never heard of you to kind of fall in love with it because they may see a picture of my knife and but never know anything about me or what I've done or any of my past work. And it's, it's something that is like, you know, I've heard this from other makers and other dealers. They're like, allow the customer to fall in love with your design. So don't keep changing this and doing this because then they don't have that opportunity. And over time, I found that to be true. So I am known for several designs that are very popular, but there are so much more that I wish I could put out. And, and you know, that might be a good thing because like how many, you know, how many pockets are we talking about, right? I mean, <laughs> well, not only that, but it shows uh, that you have a fertile creative mind and, and, you know, there's, there aren't enough mills in the world to make all the knives in your head. Hopefully. Oh man. You know, and, and that's the thing, like, I used to think that it was like, it was all like about making the best of the best. And that's what Leoma design represents. It's like really fine artistry and craftsmanship and the knives, they're handmade. They are ground by hand. Uh, they do use machinery in terms of cutting out the handles, uh, wire EVMing the blades, but all the blades are hand ground and you know, sap, hand rough satin finish or satin finish, and even the the milling between the handle material and the and the handles, you don't see any gaps in it, you know. And so that has that is all like the the love of knife designs, you know, it's a little on line. And the eutectic line is more like everyday carry. People who can beat on their knives and not worry. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about eutectic, but but before we get there, um, since you mentioned uh, the the uh, makers uh, themselves, uh, who who are they? Uh, Riat has Riat. been okay. my only manufacturer since I started this in 2014. Okay. Um, there have been, you know, other other manufacturers have messaged me and contacted me, and we have even talked at shows about doing projects. Uh, and sometimes they'll tell me things like, you know what, I can give you a better price than React. But for me, like, I look, I, I'm not concerned so much about like saving a dollar here or saving two dollars there, because I want my customers to know what they're getting is great. It's a great product that they can carry with them if they take care of it for the rest of their life. And when they, when they choose to, they can pass it on to, you know, a relative or their kids or sell it, you know, and the quality will always be there. And, you know, so it's like, it's one of these things that because I, I choose that, I'm not very concerned about saving a few bucks here and there. You know, I'm really more concerned about the fit and finish and what I'm able to deliver to my customers. I would imagine yeah. that that uh, people who collect your work are happy with that choice. And also, I would imagine, imagine that as a designer, you have to be happy to find a company like Riat that is so wow. amazing, makes such amazing knives. And it's like, uh, you know, it's a collaborative relationship, like in a musical band or what, anything else where you right. come to rely on that relationship and they're probably you have a shorthand at a certain point and they know what you want and you know how they need to operate. Yeah. And so like a lot of guys, like when I first started with them and the first products were released in like late 2014 and early 2015, I had a lot of flack from people who were like, well, why don't you build this here? And, you know, the thing is we never had a lengthy conversation, but I've tried for about 15 years to have products built in the USA. 
So now you start to see like a lot of companies building products in the USA. And I'm working with companies here to build some products in the USA. But 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. You know, it was it was the only way to get this level of quality would be to have one person build it and have that person's name on it. It would be a handmade knife, right? And it would be a custom handmade knife. So it's like, it's not that I didn't try, it's that that was not, that was not available back then. I wish it would be, you know? And so now this has, because of the, the level of precision that you can find in a lot of production knives, you see that here now, in a lot of production that's being made here in the USA. So I, I kind of think they both help one another. You know, it's not yeah. that, you know, you don't you don't want to have things built here, but it just wasn't available yet. But now okay. that it is, yeah, we're all gonna go made in the USA, we can, and we still wanna have stuff made over there. You know, yeah. so there's always gonna be different markets for different people. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it still hardly is available now. I mean, there yeah. are growing opportunities, but uh, obviously the costs are are, are uh, more difficult to maintain here. Uh, but I know it can be done. We're starting to see it slowly um, yeah. happen. Uh, I want to I want to get to sort of an abstract question before we. I want to talk about the eraser, uh, um, yeah. your your first big mainstream design. But before we get there, you mentioned the term perfect. Uh, when you sit down and design, you're talking about all your designs and, you know, obviously they're not all perfect, but what to you is a perfect knife when you, when, when do you know you're done designing it? So perfect, it is a moment in time. And I have this, uh, like thing that I say to myself is that I continuously push forward and evolve and so when the eraser from CRKT uh, was debuted, that was, you know, like you said, like 12 years ago, right? And so over time, you know, with different productions, I was like, okay, I would like to add this. I would like to add this. And, you know, so it's, it's like perfection when I say that is that moment in time. And as I evolve, there are going to be evolutions to these designs. And I am getting set to actually release the eraser like <gasps> 2.0 in my production line. Oh. And oh. yeah, these have like blind screw titanium bolsters. Uh, they're gonna be magnet cut. Uh, they're gonna be like nested uh, tight, uh, carbon fiber, nested liner lock. And there's a opening hole and a flipper. So, you know, over the years, I kind of was like, you know, as people wanted to fidget more their knives, I noticed that, you know, just having a flipper was not enough. So there needs to be other ways of um, being able to deploy the blade, you know, and also there are a lot of people who like to choke up on the knife when they're using it, you know, and keeping in mind with a lot of things, you know, we tried to do the fit and finish where the blade was center in the handle. Uh, and the clip is reversible, you know. So all these things, and you know, the pivot not rotating, mm -hmm. all these little things that really become more for as the design evolve. So yeah. So uh, that original eraser with CRKT uh, seemed very. Uh, first of all, it had a four inch blade, uh, beautiful design. It was. Uh, I think it was interesting because uh, I think it was one of the early knives that really brought in sort of the um, tactical or modern locking folding worn cliff or sheep's foot style blade we weren't seeing much of that before then and yeah. uh, and and I, I feel like that was at the very beginning of this uh, at uh, of this wave that crested you know it's still it's still rolling people still love those blades but it was one of the early ones and I think so that blade shape really knocked people socks off and that's it made it really popular so this knife is like because of my background i wanted to create a knife that you know someone could feel comfortable using it to slice food and that's why they have the wide uh blade that is also dropped below the handle for easier use and yeah the flipper does you know may interrupt the, the cutting edge 
but it does it is usable as a camping tool you know and that's one of the reasons why i designed it that way that even though yes any knife can be tactical and i agree i agree totally that point that they took a chance on this design and you know i'm very grateful for you know crkt for taking a chance on me all these years to actually uh you know take a chance on a design that may totally bomb you know and 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 they they made it and and it it was great and uh there are pieces made by a uh, custom maker john w smith of that same design because he made that design and also strider knives uh made the fixed blade version of that knife oh cool so i think yeah. i've seen that uh but so let me ask you has the mission changed between the first eraser the crkt and this current eraser and i'll tell you why i ask i'm looking at the blade the the blade is now full flat ground as opposed to hollow ground and it's a little less stabby if you will a little less pointy right. um right. and and now it looks more like you said kitchen utility than maybe right. um fighting knife if you will or self-defense knife D did the mission change it that for me like it, it, it was maybe you know prior i was thinking like yeah this because the handle is very comfortable in multiple grips right from this grip this grip to even the ice pick grip right and doing that you this knife can lend itself to a lot of different tasks but Seeing what people actually use it for, ninety percent of the time they're gonna use it to cut their food. Yeah, right. They're not gonna be. Listen, I hope no one ever has to defend themselves with a knife. Okay, seriously. But yeah, so over time, you know, as 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 I evolve, I see that most of my knives are being used. If they're being used outdoors, they're gonna be cutting food. You know, and so they're not gonna be like you know. Hopefully not in a self-defense type, but if it does need that, then anything can can be self-defense tools, sure. you know. But I just want it to be functional. I want it to be to feel right in your hand, and that's the most important thing. Anything that doesn't feel right in your hand, you probably will never carry. You yeah. mentioned your uh, Malaysian heritage, uh, very Correct. very rich blade culture. And uh, just holding up the um, eraser again, if you would, the pommel, uh, the tail end reminds me of any number of uh, hilts or pommels you might see um, on the on the handle of a of a Malaysian knife uh, with that right. deep scoop and 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 the sort of horse hoof shape a little bit. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of that. Yeah. So early on, I, I tried to incorporate a lot of different handles and blades from Southeast Asia, you know, and the very beginning, I designed um, a lot of karambits. Um, and they were all like handmade and custom made, but that, you know, I, I've kind of went away from that. But yeah, I, I, I really focus a lot of blades uh, from Southeast Asia and the handle and pommel because, you know, People do use it for camping. People do use a lot of machetes and and knives outdoors, you know. Uh, and so I really try to see like where it would draw in and make a modern version of it with modern materials uh, that you know would be appealing to to people who instead of just a wooden handle but a carbon fiber or all titaniums that sculpted. Um, yeah, that was really my my. Uh, vision i guess yeah well I, I love it because i love uh the weapons and knives and swords and such of southeast asia and and uh yeah that the the knife reminds me a little bit of maybe a parang or something i don't mm -hmm. know it, it has that uh but but like you say totally modern totally stylish i mean you could wear that with a tuxedo carry that with a tuxedo right. but 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 do all your campsite carving and food prep with it so uh, right kind of an all-arounder let's talk about the birth of leong ma design as a company um and you know you, you have crkt and then um a little while later i noticed uh a, a, more of your knives coming out under your own shingle how did that happen and what was your first knife 
So, um, you know, there, there is, like, I think Ken Onion is like the first guy who really was like on the map for doing collaborations with uh, companies. And he created this, the formula. So all of us were trying to emulate what he has really been successful at, which is collaborations with companies. And, you know, I first started with collaborating with custom knife makers. Uh, and, you know, as you know, custom knife makers became rock stars and it's, it's harder and harder to get work by them. So eventually, you know, I had to break on my own. And even though I'm, you know, Sarah KT made several of my designs, they could not make all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I branched out with, um, you know, in looking for companies here in the U.S. And I have boxes of products that uh, will never see the light of day because they are horrible or then they, they never fit it. And then um, I found, I saw a picture of this knife called the Horizon by React. Ah, yes. And I think that was like one of their first knives. And I bought one. And I think I bought it from Blade HQ. Okay. Somehow or another, the chatter was that this guy named David Dang, you know, had this company and making it. And so I, um, <laughs> I, I look on the web everywhere to try to find it. And I found their website. I emailed them through their website. No response. And somehow or another, I found him on Facebook and I messaged him and I said, are you the David Dang of React Knives? He's like, yes, I am. And I'm like, hey, I just got this Horizon A and it's fantastic. I've never seen a knife constructed like this. You know, it was M390 before M390 became popular. It was M390 blade. It was a satin, satin finish, a machine satin finish. It was a two-piece titanium handle with the backspacer incorporated into two halves of the titanium. And the fit and finish was like, you know, most custom makers couldn't even touch this. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it was just like, what the hell are you doing with these knives? And it was sold for 400 bucks. So from then on, I, I was like, well, my name is Leon Ma and I'm looking for a manufacturer. And then he responded that, oh, I've heard your name before. I was like, oh, you've heard my name before. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we talked. We talked for about six months. You know, right? And everybody warned me. They're like, dude, do not send anything to China. They're going to steal your design. They're going to rip off your money. They're going to take your money and you won't get shit. And I'm like, okay, I get that. And I, I, take you, I thank you for your advice. And so I'm like, you know, my, 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 stomach is all like churning i'm like okay do i do i actually do this or not and for like six months i'm like thinking like nah i shouldn't do this i should and finally you know i sent him the the design and then i paypal him money to make the protest i'm like oh my god now he has my ip yeah. and my money and then he's like okay it's gonna take a month for me to make two protests for you I'm like, okay so i waited I forgot about it. And I waited and I remembered, and and then he the package showed up, the two prototypes with my logo and everything, and I was like, "Holy shit, this is phenomenal! You can make this." He's like, "Yeah." Do you want to put in an order? It's like, <laughs> "Hell yeah, <laughs> I want to put in an order." And we went on from there. Which you knife know? was that? That was the Warrior One. The Warrior One. That's a Tonto. That is like the upswept Tonto. Yes, it's, it was a three and a half inch blade and flat, flat titanium handles, no pocket clips, and just a, a standoff for backspacer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was a beautiful. And then you did a Warrior Two to celebrate your fifteen years of designing yeah. or something. Is that, that right? was uh, that was the fifteen, which okay. was the XB. And I do have a Warrior Two, and maybe by Blade Show you'll see the Warrior Three. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, so, uh, that, that, what was it like? Uh, how, what I'm trying to ask you is what was the public reception of that first? Oh, re -out oh my God. Life? It was, it was unreal. So, so I didn't even know how to go about selling these because I was so new to social media and all this other stuff. 
and creating a website. So I had to go from just selling things by email that people that people who knew me to creating a website and then linking my social media to it, like which was only Instagram at the time. And then like just showing pictures, it was like everybody went gaga for it. It was and you know it's like I in one week I sold 300 pieces. Wow. You know, it was amazing. It was amazing. And I wish it was still like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know it was so new because like i'm sure there were other people reaching out to react by by that time but they needed like a proof so i was like the first proof you know i was like the first person right. to actually had a product made by them and and it wasn't like uh like oh yeah we're gonna yeah this person sent their money and didn't get nothing i actually got the product and i shipped it out to you know, all 300 customers, and a lot of people still have it and carry it. You know, oh, yeah. which is the most amazing thing to me, which is like, it's such a, an honor and a privilege to be in this business when you can develop a relationship and it lasts, it lasts and keep and keep going on. And the people who come up to my table and they're like, hey, I have this knife. I'm like, oh my God, that's like six, seven years ago. Yeah, like, it's my favorite knife. You know, and so I do my best with if there's someone message me for like uh, hardware, I send it to them. Someone needs a clip, I send it to them. But over the course of the last 10 years, Bob, like all the knives I've sold, I probably have about two dozen emails, maybe a little bit more for people who needed hardware and clips. And it's yeah, just and like, that's probably user error, like uh, you know, yeah. broken on a car door or something. Yeah, and it, and and so it's just like, yeah, of course, my knives are guaranteed for life as long as you don't abuse it. You know, and and that's why I tell people at the show, I'm like, if you don't abuse it, as long as I'm alive and I can get you a part, I'll get it to you. You, just, you might have to wait, you know, and that's it. So there's a uh, you can you can see. From those first early uh the earlier knives like uh, the eraser we were talking about the warrior uh still some of that there were larger uh knives a little bit more uh, or i shouldn't say a little bit more but aggressive looking um mm -hmm. tactical looking um, oh, yeah. and then and then you can see an uh an evolution or a a change um in your design tell me how yeah. your philosophy has evolved and how your oh, design yeah. sense has changed so like in my present website um i used to have a gallery in my older website <clears throat> and it, were, it was all the custom collaborations that i've had all the way from 2002 and you know you you would see the karambits you would see like the really aggressive blades and uh really upswept and really you know even hot bills but along the way I, I noticed that people were not using those blades as much so really i evolved to to really for users to be able be able to use my knives easier mm -hmm. and so a lot of my favorite blades now you know, like the, the Tanto, it's a beautiful grind to, to grind a traditional Tanto with like the, the, the deep hollow grind and then the convex tip, right? But most people don't even use them. They, they will use like a hollow ground, uh, drop point blade or clip point, uh, spear points. Um, you know, that's why I haven't really come up with a, a dagger because it's like, they aren't really using those type of knives. They use like a really flat ground dark point blade. And so noticing that, and, and I'm like, okay, do I want my knives to just be looked at or do I want my knives to actually be used? And that's the question that I had to answer. So this is an example of a Tanto grind for my Tanto one, right? So it's a hollow uh, main grind and then the, the tip is convex, as you can see where, by the way the light bounces off the tip. You know, now this is fairly usable to me, but most people would want like my GSB, which is fully flat ground and 
you know, that's just a spear point type of blade. Like they will use this this one more mm-hmm. than the Tonto. So noticing that the Tonto is like a love affair. <laughs> it's like a love letter to myself. And the GSD, which stands for get shit done, is the user that everybody always use. That uh, GSD has gone through a number of uh, designs, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the first ones were made by a knife maker named David Mosier. Oh, yeah. Uh, super nice guy. Yeah, great. Name, and um, this version is more like the version that CRKT built. Oh, that's beautiful. And what we incorporated in something like this that no other production company are doing is we sculpted the backspacer. So it is two halves, two titanium halves that, that are... Yeah, it's two titanium halves, so the backspacer is incorporated into each half, and then it's sculpted. So it looks like it looks like an integral, but it's the full integral. You know, I I I just know anecdotally that to um, make those kind of smooth radius surfaces mm-hmm. in a mill is very costly and time consuming. Um, it, it it almost seems like doing that, making two halves. Uh, that come together to look integral uh, might even be more difficult than a full integral, though I know there's a lot of material loss there. What's I know you've designed one of those, and right. integral is a one-piece handled knife. Right. What's that like? What's so, the difference in designing? Oh, oh, for me, the designing is easy, right? So <laughs> the the this is actually harder than an integral because I have to you know, uh, sculpt the parts, extrusion and, and mill and, and stuff in, in SolidWorks. And then I have to bring it all together and put it all together, right? Whereas an integral handle is just one piece and I can s- cut away the middle. And it's like, <laughs> oh, man, this is a lot less time consuming in drawing stage. But for them, they're probably like cursing my name every time they have to look at it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a. I mean, imagine that, uh, if you will, like a a uh, you know a block of titanium. Remove everything that's not a knife. You know, right. oh, wow, that's a lot. That's probably hard to program. Takes a long time. A lot of yeah. materials. And you know, I'm sure there are boxes of parts that is in the shop that don't make it out, right? And that's one of the good things about working with uh, a factory that you that you trust is that you're not going to get stuff that you know one worked right one didn't work so well and one was okay you know so you don't ever want that and that's why i i've kept the relationships uh with react so well and so in going back with the part i mean i'm sure to mill out just the center part of all the titanium mm-hmm. that probably took about 20 hours okay that, that, and then if there was any kind of burr or, or, or something that was not in the, in, the, in the thing, they have to go in there and clean it out. So it is a very time-consuming process. It is a labor of love. And I'm glad they're getting the acknowledgement that they're getting now. You know, because everyone just think, you know, back when I was a collector, you know, this is the 90s and the 2000s, right? People would think CNC machine, oh, you're throwing a piece of metal and you get a knife out. No, <laughs> not how a CNC yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. You know? it's, it's, so it's, I, it's, yeah. I was going to say, it's just another tool in the process and it's yeah. a very powerful tool, uh, tool right. uh, but ultimately you need people who know how to wield it and then know what to do once the pieces come out of it. Like you yeah. said, it doesn't spit out a knife, <laughs> you know, right. it, 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 it gets you started on parts basically yeah. uh, is, is my understanding. Um, so you have a, a bunch of knives in your catalog. Uh, how many? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh my in, God, uh, I lost, for, I lost for, that, dude. For Leong Ma design. Okay, so for uh, Leong Ma bunch. design, that's probably roughly about thirty designs. Okay, and then Eutectic. How how did that happen, and why? So Eutectic came about. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of uh, more cost 
effective brands or, or more lower cost brands, right? Or price conscious brands. Mm -hmm. And really it's like, do you want your do you want your customers to be able to use your knife? That was the question I asked myself. So sometimes I get a knife back for uh, cleaning and I'm looking at the knife. I'm like, the only thing that's in here is pocket lint. And this knife has never been used, right? It might be used to cut an envelope or something, or you know, maybe maybe a, a, a piece of salami, but mm -hmm. it's not really used. Used, so, you know, somebody just wanted me to clean it for them, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it, no problem. <laughs> but it's like the you know, I asked myself these questions over time, like, okay, I want my customers to actually be able to use my product, give me feedback so I can make better products. And give me honest feedback, not be like, oh, this sucks. Well, tell me how it sucked. What happened that made it suck? So I can make a better product for you the next time. And that for me has always been the driving core of why I'm in this business. You know, it's, it's why, you know, like even my cooking, I'm like, okay, what could I have done different to make this taste better? Did I brown this enough? Did I let it marinate long enough? Did I, you know, use the right seasoning? Did I put enough salt on this? So these are things I could ask myself in the in this business of design. And it is really to be able to give my customers or people who, you know, look at my knife, like, hey, this is a very well thought out design. He put some, he put some brain power into this. And that's one of the reasons why, like, when you ask me about designs, I have tons of designs, you know, that really aren't going to see the light of day because, you know, I want to focus on the existing ones and making them better. And if I get customer feedback, okay, I'll, I, I look at it and I'm just like, hmm, you know what? This person took the time to write to me a, a very well thought out paragraph. I really look at it. So, like for example, a few years ago, I came up with my cup, and the cup was uh, in L Max, and this was a monoblock handle. So one side, it's like the Strider knives uh, right. FMF, and one side was carbon fiber or G10, and the locking side will be titanium. Now, I thought this was fine. This was perfect. This is 3.5 ounces. Okay. Uh, 3.5 inch blade, but the originals was three inch and four inch blade. Now, I had the same guys like, you know, I wish you would have both sides titanium or both sides carbon fiber or both sides G10 because I don't like the, the polarizing look of one side being a different material, right? And so I got enough of that and I was like, okay, David, stupid question here, but how hard is it to make a titanium monoblock? And he's looking at me like, we can do it. So for this next run of cuffs, we're going to do a 3.5 inch in a titanium monoblock. So I don't know if you see the line, but you might be able to see the line right there where it blends really well. It almost looks like an integral. Yeah. But it's this like an off-center off seam, right? Is, yeah. Am I seeing yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's off-center. So it's not like the other one where it's half and half. This is the one side is all backspacer on the, on the non-locking side. That's cool. And we're going to be using MagnaCut on these. So cuff, kitchen utility folder. All uh, right. I, Tell tell me about, uh, about the origin of this knife, and then I got we got to so, get back to you, Tectic more. So okay, I find so out more about that because of my background, I was like, why don't I make a folding kit tonight? Uh, granted, okay, I do not expect anybody to actually use this in the kitchen. Okay, first of all, and I've seen videos of people purposely getting like tomato seeds in the pivot, and I'm like, okay, then you're an idiot if you're purposely <laughs> getting junk in the pivot right because it's a folder and this is just for like if you need a folder to cut stuff while you're like you know needing to cut stuff with a folder and it happens to be food then you use this knife right 
And the other purpose of this knife would be the lower edge handle ratio would make it easier for you to cut product, to cut things like, you know, meat and, and vegetables, but you don't purposely get stuff in the pivot, you know, yeah. so you can just yeah. wipe off the blade and be done with it. Um, so because of my background, I was like, why don't I come up with a folding kitchen knife? So the cuff is the first folding kitchen knife on the market. And now there are other versions, uh, there are lower cost versions from other brands, but this is the first iteration of it. And I've evolved the looks of it from the custom side. So the, the first guy to make it was a New Mexico maker named Eddie J. Baca. And he's actually the first guy who collaborated with me before he even had kids. And now his kid is out of college and working, working in the industry, you know? So it's, it's like, you know, all these relationships, like I said, you know, like it's long-term, it's not like a, you know, it's a long-term relationship and I still see him at the shows. So he was the first one to make this, but this has evolved to where this is now. And I'm very proud of this version, you know, to be able to have a monoblock. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty, that is pretty cool. I haven't seen that. Uh, I want to go back to Eutectic. Uh, I find especially the clip point blade so beautiful, so handsome, very clean. Your designs are all very clean. Some of them are embellished with, um, uh, you know, some, some of your uh, LMD designs are embellished with inlays and stuff. But on the whole, your designs are very clean and functional. Um, I'm sorry. Can you hold that back up? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, this this one really uh, strikes me. That that uh, blade shape is gorgeous. Tell me a little bit about how you decided uh, to go ahead with Eutectic and who's making these. Is this also Riot? It is Riot, but it's not inside the Riot factory. Riot is inspecting the quality and final QC from all the so I tell the story, it is like, because when you go to Yang Zhan, which is where all the knives are coming out from, um, it is factories, like legitimate factories, like Riyadh, We, you know, all these uh, best tags, but a lot of smaller houses, like people who live in these houses, they also have CNC machines. And then there are other shops that are operating out of garages and stuff like we do here but they are producing tons of knives. So because of their knives that they cannot, they don't have the machine time for in their own factory, they can subcontract to friends of theirs that are literally down the street from where they are, right? And so their, their wire EDM guy is down the street from where they are. Their heat treaters are maybe half a mile away from where they are, you know? And they have uh, people who make their hardware with Swiss screw machines. So that's, you know, you can design your own hardware and they will make it for you. So these are not made in the React shop, but React is overseeing all the production of them and they oversee all the QC. And every one of them that I have had, uh, they flip amazing. I mean, the detent on these things are so like right on, you know? So, and it's hard because the Trinity uh, has three methods of opening from the front flipper to the traditional flipper to the hole. And the detent works with all three. Wow. Yeah. That's that, that can be a real challenge dialing in a detent as they say for yeah. those three different uh, methods of opening. That's really fascinating. This, that this is um, that, you know, it's subcontracted out in a city full of knife people people right. who all work in the knife industry in one way or another, or many yeah. of them, I should say. Um, is that a model uh, that that Riyadh uses uh, on the regular, or is this something that, no, that you I kind mean, of work, is, pioneered I, with? I, I work with him on it, and this took this took years to get. And and when I announced this at like uh, the 2020 SHOT Show, nobody knew that COVID was going to happen, right? And all of a sudden, COVID happened, and everything got shut down. And even in China, they had it worse than we did in the with in, with in terms of shutdown. They went crazy overboard on it to the point where they shut down, and they had to shut down the factory over and over again. So it took me like three years to get these. Uh, whereas I was expecting them to to land after the shot show, right? 
So with that, that has been the delay. And but they have continuously, you know, been in communication with me. And, you know, so we uh, we have these now and we're selling them through our site and through a, a few dealers. And really, it's the it's the affordable knife from Leo Ma that I want more people to use and you know not feel bad if they drop it on the ground or something or not feel bad if they got a scratch on it or you know if uh you know they have to like I usually use it in my yard because uh, living in Florida everybody has a yard and yard work to do so after I bring it in I wash it in my sink and I leave it to air dry and that's about it. You know, yeah, yeah. I, uh, that's called the Trinity there. And then there's a drop point, which I, I, I don't, it, it appears to be a little smaller. Yeah. So this is a 3.5 inch blade and the Trinity is 3.75 inch. Uh, and the EFD, this is the EFD is the everyday field duty. So that, oh, that's based on point. your higher end field duty model, right? Correct. Correct. Wow. So the Trinity is slimmer. But the EFD is a slightly wider as like the field duty is. And there's only two metrics of opening, just the front flipper and the hole. So yeah. Uh, yeah, just in general, I mean, I'm looking at those two knives and I think they're both really handsome. I like I like the look of them and I, I've uh, seen plenty of reviews on them and I handled them at Blade Show. Um, it's exciting to see that that this line exists uh, and hopefully you fill it in um, as time goes on. Are, are you um, in, in terms of designing for both Liang Ma design, which is your higher end stuff and mm -hmm. Utectic, well, what do you see in the offing? Are you uh, 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 do you get fascinated by uh, certain blade shapes and kind of go off on tangents? What do you have coming up? I look for like so. You know, having the Leo Ma line is is great because you start to get the feedback from people, and there are people who like in my podcast and and like uh, and when I post pictures, they're like, "Can we get a eutectic version of this?" Huh. And it's like, okay, if I get enough of these comments or emails and stuff like that, I will explore this because uh, there are people who want more more cost effective uh, versions of my Leo Ma knives. And if that means that it has it is access to people using my knife, I'm more than up for it. You know, of course, you know, they have to be done right. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It might happen in 2025 or 2026 because I have productions going into 2025 already. Mm -hmm. And um, so it might probably be 2026 when this release, you know, and really looking at, at these things, you kind of start seeing a timeline of these releases and really be able to build the projects up and, and gauging the interest. And, you know, because we, we're not just coming out with a knife, which come out with like, we just choose the steel. We're going to choose like what kind of finishers we're going to choose what kind of handle material and maybe even the different locks that we might be using, you know? So it's, it's all these things that have to go into the thought and, and, and fin finalizing it before we even come out with it. And really at the end, it's like, how easy is it for a customer to maintain this product? As a designer and a business owner, um, uh, is Eutectic or could Eutectic, the company, be used as a test bed for, uh, since the whole prospect is uh, less, co less costly, could the Eutectic line be a place where you test out, mm, I don't want to say crazy, but designs that you're not sure people are going to oh, yeah. go for oh yeah i mean a lot of companies are doing stuff like this now where they have limited runs and you know so it is it is possible to do limited runs you know it is possible to do like to test out uh you know different handle materials that we may not be able to get a lot of at first but just to see like let's do this color and let's see what the what what people what people like or not because right now this is the line where you can do the experiment and not, let's say, like this field duty with like the Dama Steel, Mokutai, oh, and Arctic man. Storm. And, you know, it's like, yeah, you're not going to want to do a lot of experiments when it comes to stuff like this. Yeah. But, 
yeah, I mean, the other stuff where, you know, where you can play with different materials and uh, all kinds of different G10s that like my card is now, I would love to play with all that stuff, you know? And even the, the steels, I mean, you know, we have, we have access to a lot of different steels and even stuff that at one point uh, may be limited, but now you're like, hey, you, well, let's try that. Let's try that steel. Let's see how well it cuts. Now, to us, like I can make any knife sharp, right? And I have no qualms about getting a knife resharpened. I have, there's nothing wrong with me resharpening a knife, right? But there is this theory out there like, oh, can you make it like Rockwell 67 so it will stay sharp longer? And I'm like, uh, you know, that'll probably chip your edge a lot faster, right? It, it, you know? And, and well, it's okay. Of, I don't cut anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what I think they would say. <laughs> but it's like lately I've been getting that. Like, can you make it Rockwell 64 to 67? I'm like, why do you want that? <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll get right on it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you 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 kind of get like people who have like these uh fantasies of like the perfect knife, right? The perfect knife. Or like the apocalypse or something, right? <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, okay, you're supposed to be able to resharpen a knife. That's it. You know, a knife is made for to be resharpened. Just just learn how to do it. There's plenty of great systems like Wicked Edge. Wicked Edge is a great system, and you can go and resharpen your knife easily with them. You know, and even if you take it to the show, they'll resharpen your knife for you. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Leong, as as we close here, I, I want to ask you, what is it about knife designing that keeps you coming back? Uh, to me, it seems like, it, well, like any artistic pursuit, and that's, that's, that is what this is to some extent, to a large extent, but it's also yeah. a business pursuit, uh, like it 100% is, it of a business bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Um, what is it that keeps you in it? Really... What keeps me in it is really be able to get feedback from my customers over the years of how well my knives feel for them. Okay, how well it feels in their hand and it's almost an, ex an extension of their hand. And really the relationships that I've built over the last 20 plus years in this, I mean, you you don't have that in many industries, you know? Like some of the makers I collaborate with, man, you know what? They're great people. And they took a chance on me and I took a chance on them and we created a great product out of it. And really that is, you don't see that in a lot of different industries, you know? So yeah, you're right. A part of this is business. Because if I wasn't in this business, I would still be in the kitchen. I'll probably be working 80 to 90 hours a week on my feet, running around. Uh, and I think at this point in time, I'm quite happy where I am. Could it all change? Sure. Sure, it could be. You know, I, you know, I look for, for, things to see how I can evolve over time, uh, you know, and I, and I look at that in terms of, you know, myself, uh, things I cook, even my, uh, my designs, I evolve over time. And this business has allowed me to do that. And it's actually evolved and it's actually in a stage now that I'm very happy to see like a lot of manufacturing has come back, trickled back into the, into America. I'm very happy about that. You know, and I see like, you know, myself being able to build more products here. And I collaborate with um, uh, White River Knife and Tool recently oh, yeah. with the kitchen knife stuff. And, you know, it took several years for them to actually, because when they, when, when we, when we talked about, it, they were like an immediate yes. And then they had to go and reverse engineer everything to, to build kitchen knives because they never built kitchen knives before. And so I am so proud that, you know, I have a product that's built by them 
and from a family that cares so much about what they're putting out there you know so it's just like you know going back to relationships going back to how to keep building and how to keep serving you know my customers and so it's like you know it's just like there's no greater reward you know and to see like my customers be my friends you know um i have two friends here locally uh they're named uh joe and eric and even alan folks lives like five minutes from me yeah. and we all go out for lunch we all go you know you know go go do stuff together and it's like i wouldn't have that if it wasn't for this business you know and they help me they help me do inventory they want to help me go to sh uh, uh be at my booth at shows you don't really have that at, in, in a lot of different industries where people you know just want to see you do well you know and yeah and so like i get a lot of questions from people who want to be in this business and i'm like yeah let's set up a call I'll tell you the facts. And as long as you're okay with that, go forward. You know, but it's not it's not a get rich quick. You're gonna have to put in some time and some effort. And the first, you know, even now, Friday nights, I'm folding boxes. You know, <laughs> so it's not like it's not a glamorous business. Like, you know, yeah. what you see at the show is not like real life. Okay. I'm folding boxes on Friday night. So that's it. That's the truth. Hey, you're folding boxes. I'm folding laundry on Friday night. You know, <laughs> Leong, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an honor having you here and uh, talking to you about your 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 life in knives. I I can't wait till we talk next time. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, I mean, I I love this business. So I can't wait to meet you again or see you again at Blade Show. Yeah, we'll be shaking hands in a month and a half. <laughs> yes, it's going to be Alrighty, quick. sir. Thank you. Bye. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen. Leong Ma of Leong Ma Designs. Uh, really great to... Uh, catch up with him well meet him i should say i haven't it wasn't any catching up it was meeting him and it was really great and uh yeah talking to him at blade show pales in comparison to having an hour with him uh be sure to join us next week for another great hour of knife talk on the knife junkie podcast as well as wednesday for the midweek supplemental and thursday for thursday night knives for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.